Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Writers Series. I'm Jillian Manning. I'm the new-ish executive director here at NWS, and I'm so happy to have everybody here at the Opera House. Uh, you know, it's it's still been a journey. This is, yes, round of applause. So it's only our second time back so far. So it is wonderful to be here to see some familiar faces and some folks that have not been able to come out for a little while. So thank you for coming tonight, uh, especially as we have sort of a interesting hybrid edition today. Uh, we're gonna have our best-selling author, Alex Michaelides joining us with guest host, Beth Milligan. And we've got everybody here in the audience and then our team on the live stream. Hello to everybody watching from home. And thank you to IK Productions for putting that on for us tonight. First, I want to say thank you to our sponsor for tonight's event, I'm a Call. I hope many of you had a chance to take advantage of the 25% off discount that they were offering our folks that came out and had a dinner with them tonight. Um, their tomato soup, I still think is like the best in the entire world. So if you didn't get a chance tonight, be sure to visit them in the near future. And another big thanks to our sustaining sponsor, Cordia, to our fall season sponsor, West Shore Bank, and to our arts benefactor sponsor, the Northwest Michigan Arts and Culture Network. And thanks also to our media partners, The Record Eagle and Interlock and Public Radio. And then thank you as always, to our volunteers, to our board, to our staff, to everybody that makes this wonderful production of words and reading happen, to all of our donors and to all of you that bought tickets tonight to join us. The event is also made possible in part by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. Now, to introduce our special guest for the evening, Alex Michaelides is the best-selling author of The Silent Patient and The Maidens, both of which are international bestsellers. His background is in psychotherapy and screenwriting, and you'll see both of those in his writing. It's very cinematic. It's very thrilling, uh, which I can attest to when I finished reading The Maidens, which I read in about 24 hours. I was then awake for the next 48 hours because the ending is, if you've read the ending, you know. Uh, if you haven't, go buy a book. Horizon Books is selling both The Silent Patient and The Maidens out in the lobby, so be sure to check that out before you go. Uh, I think I wanted to give you a little quote from another favorite author of mine, Lucy Foley, who I think had a similar experience when she read the book. She said of The Maidens, it's a deliciously dark, elegant, utterly compulsive read with a twist that blew my mind. So I, I would second that very heavily. Uh, and Alex is joining us tonight from across the globe on this fabulous TV uh, from our friends at Best Buy in Traverse City. And he will be in conversation with Beth Milligan, the head writer for the Traverse City Ticker. Beth is also a co-host of the podcast, Breaking the Surface, that is part of the Boardman Review and is dedicated to thoughtful deep dives into politics, pop culture, philosophy, and current events. Thank you all for being with us here tonight. Thank you to everybody who is joining us virtually from home. And please join me in welcoming Alex Michaelides and Beth Milligan. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would say uh, good evening to Alex, but I think where he is, it is now officially morning. Is that right, Alex? <laughs> it's still evening, just about, I think. Hello, hi there. Can you hear me and see me? Uh, yeah, so Alex is actually beaming in from Morocco, I believe. Is that correct? Oops, sorry, you're breaking up a little bit. I lost you for a second. Um, Oh, that's okay. That's there we go. I was just saying, I think you were coming into us from Morocco, which is just a little bit after midnight there. Sorry, Beth, are you there? Can you, I can, I can see you, but you, you froze for a second for me. Sure. And I'll ask uh, Joe, do you think we're okay to go ahead? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me, Alex? Yeah, that's fine now. There was a blip, but, uh, but you're back. Okay, good. Uh, well, I wanted to start by saying congratulations. Um, the Maidens was not only on the New York Times bestseller list this summer, but it was just chosen as one of the top books of 2021 by Barnes & Noble. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Exciting. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> so the opening lines of this novel um, kind of immediately grabbed my attention. You write, Edward Fosca was a murderer. This was a fact. And I thought that's kind of a bold way to start a mystery. <laughs> um, so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about who Edward is and what The Maidens is about. Absolutely, yeah, sure. 
So, um, so the maidens is, you know, I guess as a writer, I guess as all writers would probably attest to the fact that you're kind of drawn to the same themes again and again in your writing. And for me, my key themes, I think, which I established in The Silent Patient are, you know, um, psychology, um, uh, Greek mythology and murder. And um, they kind of, you know, they work well together, I think. And um, that's what The Maidens is coming from as well. So it's about, um, it's about Edward, it's about a story um, a, about a charismatic and sort of enigmatic um, Greek tragedy professor at Cambridge University called Edward Fosker, who is suspected of murdering his students, who are all members of a secret society known as the Maidens. And um, the heroine is a um, group psychotherapist who is convinced of his guilt and is determined to catch him, um, even at the risk of endangering her own life. Um, and so it's a, it's a, yeah, it's definitely a kind of breed of psychotherapy and um, Greek mythology and, um, and psychopathy, I think, in fact, yeah. Um, the novel is set in Cambridge, which really becomes almost a secondary character in the book. It's so beautiful and mysterious and steeped in history and tradition. And it, it really lends itself to the kind of atmosphere of the novel. And I know you went to university at Cambridge. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your experience there and how that influenced the Maidens. Totally. Well, you know, so I, ever since I was a student there, I had always wanted to write about it um, because it's, it's, a, it's a really incredibly beautiful place um, and, you know, mysterious and haunting and secretive. And so it felt to me like it was, you know, crying out to be a backdrop to a thriller in a way or a mystery or a suspense kind of story. And um, what happened was that, uh, you know, I'd been mulling over this idea of writing about it for, you know, for a couple of decades. And then uh, when I finally decided I was going to write The Maidens and set the story there, um, I realized, that, you know, I hadn't been a student there for 20 years. So I thought I'd better go back and look at it and take some notes and sort of rediscover it for myself. Um, and the only way that I kind of really knew how to do that was to kind of walk my way through the novel, I suppose. And so I went to Cambridge for, you know, uh, three or four times. And each time I would stay in a hotel for four or five days and I'd have a little notebook with me. And I would go from chapter one to chapter two and do everything that Mariana, the heroine, was meant to be doing when she was meant to be doing it. So when she was, you know, meant to be in the Eagle Pub at 9 p.m. on Thursday, I would then go to the Eagle Pub on Thursday at 9 p.m. and sit there and sort of take notes of what I was, you know, I thought it was going to be a kind of atmospheric note taking. So it would be about, you know, things that I smelled or heard or saw. Or, but what actually happened was, was, was more interesting because um, it, it's a story about a woman who's haunted by her past. And as I spent day after day in Cambridge on my own, I began to be haunted by my past. And so I began to see, you know, um, friends that I'd lost or, or lovers that I'd lost or even myself at 18 kind of peeping around corners and things and following me around the city and I got sad sadder and sadder and sadder as I did this and it was suddenly and then suddenly the novel came alive to me because I was able to kind of channel all of this into the book itself and so it became a very much like um the whole novel became very much like a cathartic experience for me in all kinds of ways actually. Yeah you kind of answer what I was going to ask which is a lot of times when we go back uh, as adults to places that we went to college or even just places that meant a lot to us when we were young, we can experience them in quite a different way. There's nostalgia, but maybe you see things you didn't see before, or experience it in a new way. Yeah, it often takes that long. You know, I, I've thought about this a lot in writing because people say to me, where do your ideas come from? And I, and I always think, well, they come from decades of obsessing about something. And so it, it's never something that comes to you overnight. It's sort of, I, I find that, you know, inspiration something happens to you, be it painful or, or, or wonderful, and then it kind of works its way into your mind. And then 10 years later, you're like, oh, now I know how to write about this. But at least for me, I find a lot of distance is necessary to, to explore things properly. Sure. So grief is a central part of the book. And I thought that was interesting because a lot of times in thrillers or mysteries, death is a plot device it's not something that the characters emotionally process or really react to it's just kind of meant to move the the narrative forward um and i wondered if you could talk a little bit about what you wanted to explore with grief in this book yeah um i get asked that an awful lot i get asked why i'm obsessed with death and i don't really know 
because I, I, I'm grateful for your question because, you know, it, in a thriller sense, it's normally in a, a little bit of a sensationalist way. And that's not necessarily the way that I think about it at all. I think people that I've really loved have died um, and that's affected me. Um, and then you try and write a story about murder and, you, and I don't at least want to treat it in a kind of superficial way. I wanted to think about it in a very real way. Um, and so that was my beginning point. Um, and then what happened is, as a Greek person, what happens when you think about death is you immediately go to the, the myth of Persephone, um, who was abducted by Hades and taken to the underworld. And then her mother's grief was so powerful that it essentially stopped the world in its tracks and turned summer into winter and day into night. And that, that myth has been with me since I was a kid. And so you know, when I started to think about Mariana and her grief, I thought, oh, okay, I have to somehow relate this to Persephone. Um, and then I, and then I, from then I went to the idea of her being an English student at Cambridge and having studied Tennyson, um, as I did when I was a student and I fell in love with his poetry because it's incredibly mournful and sad. Um, and apparently Queen Victoria used to carry around a copy of In Memoriam with her because she said it was the only thing that ever really helped her with her grief. And so it made sense to me that Mariana, you know, grieving her husband's death might turn to In Memoriam by Tennyson. And so then Tennyson and Persephone started weaving their way into the novel. And so it's, I'm being long-winded, but what I mean is what's interesting is that you start with something which is thematic and then it ends up weaving its way back into the story. And it's a kind of back and forth process, I find. It's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I think it's timely. I mean, obviously during the pandemic, a lot of people are dealing with grief and, and sorting through pain. And so it was nice to see a thriller that had those um, like emotional depths to it. It was, I thought, really well done. Thank you. Um, so the ending, <laughs> I'm, has anyone read the book yet in the audience? I see some hands, okay. Um, I'm not gonna give it away because it's delightful to experience it for yourself. Um, but I don't think maybe Gone Girl is the last book I've read that kind of completely caught me off guard with the ending. Um, and I think that's harder to do with modern audiences. I think modern audiences are a little more cynical and sophisticated now. They know there's a twist ending coming, so they're looking for it. And I wondered how you try to create an ending that's gonna pack a punch, but still be believable and fit in with what you've written in the rest of the book. I think, you know, I love those kind of endings, as you can probably tell. Um, I, you know, I, I think the first time I ever really felt like this was seeing the film The Sixth Sense when I was a teenager. And it was the first time that I'd ever seen something that, that at the end it completely spins everything on its head. And so the first thing you want to do is go back and start the story again to try and understand it from this different perspective. Um, and it's something that, you know, Agatha Christie does brilliantly as well. Um, and so many other writers, you know, I have a bee in my bonnet that Henry James and Agatha Christie aren't actually that far away from each other. Because they're, they're often, uh, you know, writing about love triangles, but they, they present it from one angle and you go through the whole book thinking you're, you're seeing it that way up. And then at the end, you find out you're looking at the triangle from the wrong end. And there's something about this ability to kind of turn everything on its head, but still hold water. So you're essentially telling two stories, really which I find to be you know, really fun, fascinating, and really hard to pull off. But it, it's, um, it's almost like a visceral, emotional feeling. So you're not necessarily just reading words on a page, but you actually feel a sh sense of shock at the end, which I think is a, is a really powerful thing. And if you can put that into a novel, it's, I find that very exciting. Yeah, and obviously to do that successfully, you, it's like almost like a finely tuned clock. You have to have all these pieces in the book yeah. leading up to it. So it kind of clicks into place at the end. I um, mean, people believe it. Really? Yeah. You know, I do think these kinds of novels are very much like architecture. And so you need, to, you need to know where you're going, first of all. And so you have to plan every step of the way. But then you have to make sure that these, you know, clues aren't too obvious, that they can't be too hidden. And so the whole thing is like a delicate balance, which to take, it's, it's a lot like, um, I know nothing, I can't even sew a button, but I often, in my head, I have this fantasy that it's, it's like tapestry or something like that, because you're kind of going, adding a little bit here and then a little bit there. So it's all sort of about balance in a way, but I'm, I, I probably don't know what I'm talking about regarding sewing <laughs> or weaving. 
Sure. And you, I mean, there's always your, some of those threads, maybe in the tapestry or you've got some red herrings, you've got little clues that you maybe want a reader to think they know where you're going and you're going to pull the rug out for them and go another way. And so to keep track of all of that, to keep track of your architecture, um, I want to talk about your writing process. I saw some photos on your Instagram account where it looked like you have quite a few number of, of pieces of paper spread out on tables or on the floor to keep track of it. Can you talk about that and how you keep track of the plots of your books? Yeah, sure. It's, um, I think it's a process called mind mapping that I first read about years ago. Um, and so what I tend to do is just to take together a, a, a massive amount of pieces of paper. Um, and then I start with something in the middle, like Mariana's trying to sort through Sebastian's belongings, her husband's belongings. And then you draw an arrow to another idea and then an arrow to another idea. And what the, the reason that I like it so much is because when I write things down in a linear way, in, a, in the form of a list, my imagination kind of gets stifled somehow and it's a little bit stuck. But when you have arrows that are upside down and sideways going around the page and all in different directions, somehow you, because you can't hold it all in your head at once, it just, it, whatever reason, it frees up your imagination. And so all kinds of kind of left field crazy ideas start occurring to you and then you can kind of put them in. And then the, the real difficulty is then trying to look at this spider web, this huge cobweb in front of you and then sit down with a laptop and somehow type it up. And that's obviously a very painful and difficult experience. But, but, when, you, but when you end up with that, then you kind of have a, a story sort of, it's messy and chaotic, but it, it's often quite imaginative. Um, and from then I just try and put, order it really, put it into an outline um, and then you know, work on that outline until I have a novel. But it's all, it's all pretty much like one document from start to finish, kind of organic, I suppose. By the time you get to submitting a draft to your publisher, does that process, do you feel like you've tied up the ends neatly or do you ever get feedback like, who is this character? <laughs> what happened to this plot thread that you started over here? No, no, no because I, I think that I, I by, by planning and going over this, this outline again and again and again, and expanding this outline, I tend to stay on top of all of that. And I'm, I kind of plan an awful lot. What I don't plan is the uh, dialogue in the scenes. And so I kind of know roughly what needs to happen in that scene, but I never plan what the, what the characters can say to each other. And so that can be quite exciting when you're actually sitting down and, uh, and writing and you're surprised by what the conversation, like there's a, a dinner scene with Mariana and Edward Foster when she goes to his rooms and they have dinner. I didn't really know what they were gonna talk about in that scene. And I was terribly nervous about writing it. And I kind of put it off for a while, but then, I think when you've been sitting with the story and, and mulling with it, and, you know, walking around the park and thinking about it for a year or so, when the characters do finally sit down to talk and you haven't pre-planned it, they come alive and they do tend to chat to each other in surprising and interesting ways. You know? Yeah, you mentioned, I think I, I had read another interview where you talked about that same thing with The Silent Patient, your first book, where there were some diary entries that are crucial to that book. And you, I think, mentioned writing those towards the end. Um, and found those a little more challenging. Is it just, is, is dialogue more challenging for you or do you kind of need to know where the plot is gonna be before you can write what those characters are gonna say? Gosh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, I'm scared, I'm a little bit scared of dialogue. I think it's because of my career as a screenwriter, which, you know, traumatized and terrified me. And so I, I, I feel that I have to, you know, be ultra careful about staging scenes. I do find it as a writer, I do find it easier to write a kind of a lyrical novel. And by that, I mean inside one character's head. Um, so when I, when I wrote The Silent Patient, a friend of mine is a critic and he read it and he went, oh gosh, Alex, now I see where you've been going wrong all these years. You're, you're not a dramatist, you're a novelist. Mm. And it took me a second to see what he meant, but I understand it now because I had a real, I've always had a problem staging a scene um, dramatically. But the moment you tell me that I can go inside someone's thoughts and slow down time and go back to when they were a child and have been reminiscences and memories and go for a walk with them, suddenly they come alive for me in a way that having two people sitting across a dinner table trying to talk to each other, I find that a lot, a lot trickier. So in addition for your writing process, in addition to the sheets of paper, there were a couple other things you shared on Instagram. One was you had posted a screenshot of the notes app in your phone, and it kind of gave these little outlines of the idea of what the silent patient would be. 
Um, and I thought that was inspirational because you mentioned in your post, you know that there are other people out there who jot these creative ideas down in their phones and you just wanted to encourage them. And I guess I would encourage anyone here tonight if you've got this kind of ideas floating around that that's where it starts for a lot of people. It's just jotting notes in an iPhone and if suddenly you have a best-selling book. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was, yeah, I thought that was inspirational. You know, I think, you know, there's a couple of things to say about that, really. I think, you know, the first is that you should always have your phone with you <laughs> or, or a notebook or something, you know. So with the Sana patient, I had been, you know, playing with this idea about updating this myth by Euripides or this play by Euripides, rather, for many, many years. And then I was just walking on the, in this wild park near where I live in London. And suddenly it came to me pretty much, you know, the whole movement of the story came to me, including the twist and the ending. And I just sat down on the bench and grabbed my phone and, and just wrote it down. And it, it didn't really change massively. You know, small details did, names did, stuff like that. But the whole story essentially didn't. Um, what was that? And then, you know, as what you're, you're, you're saying you're, in your question, it, what the difficult part is then transferring that small idea into the self-belief that is required to write a novel. Um, you know, and Stephen King famously said that writing a novel is like crossing the Atlantic in a bucket. And he's completely right about that because you, you, you have to go for an awfully long time and you lose sight of land, you know, in either direction. And you just have to trust that you know what you're doing and not give in to doubt. And that's the tricky thing. I really think that's why there aren't more, that's what stops people writing novels. I think it's people give up and people lose faith in themselves. Um, and that would be my only, you know, real encouragement to any writers in the audience or who are watching us this evening is just please keep going because I, I put the, the silent patient in a drawer for, for the days and sometimes weeks at a time because I was just like, oh, this is terrible. I have to stop this. This is a waste of my time. And then a tiny little voice in my head would encourage me weeks later to take it out and have another bash at it. Um, and I, and I, you know, now it makes me so sad and afraid to think, well, what happened if I hadn't continued? I would have missed out on this wonderful thing that's happened to me, um, you know, and, and the joy that I have in writing um, if I'd given into this kind of ne these negative voices. And so it's, it's a real, you know, I think, I think it's not just talent, it's also self-belief that make, make you into a writer. Sure, and it's certainly not to diminish the work that comes between putting a note in your phone and actually writing the book. But, you know, I've, I've heard Lin-Manuel Miranda talk about this with Hamilton, too. He wrote it in his phone. I think just having that understanding for, for folks who are like, how could I ever get to that stage of being a novelist? That it a lot of times it starts in a phone that we all have, and then it's the work of, of actually writing. It goes on in a phone. I'm constantly, my phone is nothing. My notes is nothing but, but, but you know, dialogue or... or or a paragraph or something will come to me and I, often I'm just in the supermarket and I just stop and take up my phone and just have to write down the, the bit of dialogue that came to me and he, you know I find you know like um Charles Dickens was a big walker and now I've got to know more writers I hear again and again and again from people oh I walk I walk that's what I do and that's what I do you know when I so I sit and I write at my kitchen table all day or whatever and then when the writing is done I'll go and walk for an hour in the park and that's when the good work happens invariably every single day it's, some, it's when you're not thinking about it anymore and you're just writing, you're just walking and then suddenly the good dialogue or the good writing pops into your head. And so it's often, sometimes you just have to get out of your own way, I think, you know, and that's why phones are such incredible um, tools in that regard. Sometimes I've got to the point now where I, I won't even, my fingers are too clumsy to even type it and I just record it on my phone because I just want to try and get it out there before I forget this thought that I've had, you know. Technology is great in that regard these days. Uh, well, also on the technology front, I saw that you had a Spotify playlist for the Maidens, and I wondered if you could talk about how maybe some of the music you were listening to when you're writing it and how that informs what comes out on the page. Yeah, um, I was using it a lot to get myself into this mood of extreme sort of sadness, I think, really. And so a lot of the songs are, are quite mournful. Um, and I, you know, music, I, I find music incredibly inspiring. Um, I think particularly when you're trying to write something lyrical and beautiful and sad, you really need to have some great music to listen to. And so I, I listen to music a lot um, when I was coming up with ideas for the maidens. But when I write, I tend to listen to just classical music um, and often just the same pieces again and again and again. So it becomes like a white noise and then you can get yourself into a kind of trance mm -hmm. in a way. Uh, well, I also want to talk about The Silent Patient, which was your first novel. Um, it was a huge success. It debuted at number one, the New York Times bestseller list. It stayed there for a year. I think it was published in close to 50 countries. 
Um, and I think one of the things I wanted to ask you about was, first of all, I guess the international success of both of these books. You're in Morocco right now. I know you've toured extensively in other countries. And I'm just wondering if it's as simple as audiences everywhere, like a good thriller and like a good mystery, or if you think there are some specific themes in your books that kind of appeal to an international audience. I don't know about the answer to that. I mean, you know, that's a, I'd love to know the answer <laughs> to that question. Um, I, the only thing that I can say is that, uh, I, you know, I, it was incredible when the, when the Silent Patient was so successful and it was wonderful traveling the world. But what I kept hearing again and again from people as I traveled was that they would say to me, oh, I don't read thrillers, but I loved your book. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I think there's something about, so what I try to do with The Silent Patient, and again with The Maidens, is, is I'm really drawn to a classic thriller plot. I love that kind of thing. Um, but on the other hand, I like to marry it with a kind of a deeper emotional and psychological sensibility, I suppose. And wanting to write about you know, psychotherapy and what it feels like to have loved and lost and be traumatized and have a terrible childhood and all these sorts of things on top of a thriller plot, I think allowed it to kind of cross over from one thing to another, if you see what I mean. And so I think it appealed to more people that it might have done if it had just been a standard thriller. But I'm just guessing. I don't know what people, why these things happen, you know. Sure. Uh, and you, you don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth either, I'm sure. No, 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 <laughs> Well, so The Silent Patient starts with a, a similar bold opening as The Maidens do, which is, you know, right up front, this character, Alicia, has murdered her husband. It's, it's right on the book jacket. It's how the book starts. So you know this murder has happened. You know who has committed it, which is often what the book is supposed to be about. Um, so then obviously you're going to delve into different other mysteries in the book. Um, you now, she's uh, institutionalized. She's refusing to speak. She's silent after this murder. And it's up to Theo, the psychotherapist, to kind of unlock her secrets. I, there are two kind of big themes in both of these books that I want to talk to you about. And you, you mentioned them briefly. But one is psychotherapy and one is Greek mythology. Um, and so starting with psychotherapy, which is really important in The Silent Patient, um, I know you've had some experiences with therapy. Could you talk a little bit about your own experience with it and how it's influenced these books? Yeah, sure. If I may, before I answer that, um, if I may just touch on the opening line, um, because you brought up the maidens as well. And I, and I think it's, you know, I think it's instructional and helpful and just honest if I admit that what a huge influence Ruth Randall has been on me, um, the crime novelist. I think probably the greatest British crime novelist, really. Um, and she wrote a novel which I have been obsessed with my whole life called um, A Judgment in Stone. Um, and if anyone has not read it, please, please grab a copy because it's the best crime novel ever written. And, and that, that starts with the, with the line, um, Eunice Parchment killed the Coverdale family because she could not read or write. And when I first read that, I was just like, that's not how you begin a detective story. That's crazy. You don't tell me who did it and why they did it. That's insane. But um, by doing that, it allows you to delve into the reasons, the, the psychological reasons why someone did something. Mm -hmm. And then you open up into a whole different world of suspense and mystery, which is, you know, kind of much more interesting, much more profound. And it's also just a very bold way to begin the story. And there's something about that that really appealed to me because you feel like, wow, if you're prepared to tell me all of that information in the opening line, then what other tricks have you got up your sleeve? You know, it means that you have to have more. And that, there's something about that approach that I, I just, I really love. Um, and so that's where those lines came from. Um, regarding the, the psychotherapy in The Maidens um, and in The Silent Patient, um, I came to therapy very much as a patient. You know, I think I was pretty quite, I was anxious and depressed as a teenager, and quite neurotic. Um, I probably still am, but I am less so. But thanks to therapy, I found an amazing therapist when I was about 20. Um, and I saw her for about 10 years. Um, and she helped and inspired me so much that I thought that I wanted to kind of continue it. I wanted to study therapy. So I, I then started um, uh, studying it. And I also worked in a psychiatric unit for teenagers for two years. Um, and ultimately I didn't graduate um, uh, or qualify as a therapist for all kinds of reasons. Um, the main reason was that I uh, realized that I was a writer, not a therapist. Um, and the other reason was, you know, to be honest with you, I have an ambivalent relationship with therapy because I encountered a, a huge number of brilliant therapists, but I also encountered a lot of completely crazy therapists too. Um, and it was something about the fact that therapy always comes down to the individual skill of a human being, unlike, you know, medicine or law or dentistry or something. And so I'd felt that I'd never really seen that kind of 
honest representation of therapists in a novel before, even like it's something like The Sopranos on TV, which I, I just love, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not what I would say is an accurate representation of any therapy that I've ever been in. And so I thought that it'd be really fun to try and tell the truth about what it's really like to be a therapist and what it's like to be in a, in a therapy room and working with a patient. Um, so that was where it came from. Yeah, I think there's probably an assumption. Oh, hang on. <laughs> I think there's probably an assumption that um, within therapy, just like any other sort of medical field, that they're impartial and you're going to just trust their objectivity. But I think your books make it clear and what you're just saying makes it clear is that they are humans <laughs> just like us. Yes. And like you were saying, probably just like the same way the skills of a writer are, are individualistic. It really comes down to each person and their own foibles. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. But that's what makes them interesting as characters and as people, you know. Um, and I, I've definitely felt that with the maidens, there was more stuff that I wanted to explore because I studied, you know, I specialized in group therapy. Um, and so when I was writing The Maidens, I thought that it'd be really interesting to look at groups because, you know, a Cambridge College is also a group and The Maidens is a secret society, which is also a group. Um, and, uh, and Mariana is a group therapist. And so when we first meet her in London, she's practicing group therapy. And I had, some, you know, I, I had all kinds of crazy experiences with group therapy. So I, I had the first experience I had was amazing. And I was in a group for a year and a half, which was fantastic. And then I had a second group that was run by a professor who was supposedly very eminent and, you know, and, and very um, important. And when uh, I was in the group with him, I, I just experienced him as, as really narcissistic and really sadistic. And he would pick on very vulnerable people in the group and sort of make them cry or try and make them angry. And I just, it, it, it really riled me because I'd come from such a supportive therapeutic therapy for 10 years. And I just didn't understand why somebody would be acting like that. Um, and it, you know, it, it, it made me stand up for myself in a way because I'd always my whole life put all of my authority into teachers and people who I thought knew more than me. And then I suddenly had this revelation in this group therapy session that, um, that I, I don't care how important you are um, or how many letters you have after your name. If you don't know anything about you know, compassion or, or kindness, then you don't have anything to teach me. And I got up and walked out of the therapy session and I quit my, my training. Um, and it took, it took a lot of guts to do that. And it was a very difficult time. And it was 10 years, which goes back to our earlier chat about um, how long things inspiration takes. It was 10 years before that then came from merged into an idea for the maidens. And I thought, oh, well, instead of having it in a, in a therapeutic setting, I could have this dangerous man be in, a, in an academic setting instead. Um, and then you can sort of see how this crazy thing happens in groups where in large groups or small groups, we tend to infantilize ourselves and regress to a very young part of ourselves and we make the group leader into our father or into our mother. And often we find it very hard to disagree with the group. We find it very hard to stand up, and walk out as I did or, or challenge the leader. And then you just have to look at you know, history, politics throughout history to see often when we put our faith and you know, trust in a, in a group lead, in a kind of cult-like group leader like that, they turn out to be completely insane. Um, and it, you know, it's a really, again, it's a very, it's a very interesting thing. This this whole process of trust in human beings and what that looks like in relationships and in groups, and and that was what I wanted to bring into the maidens as well. Uh, so you mentioned Greek mythology was also a major theme in both of the books. In in the Silent Patient, you wrote, "Every Greek knows his tragedies. The tragedies are our myths, our history, our blood." Um, you were born and raised in Cyprus, which was historically a Greek island. And I wondered if Greek mythologies were a big part of your childhood and how that shaped your worldview. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, they were everything to me, you know. So I grew up in Cyprus, which is like tiny, tiny, it's this big, a tiny, tiny uh, Greek island. And it was Aphrodite's island. And um, she was born just off the coast of Cyprus and she swam to Cyprus. And then she claimed the island as her own. And um, there are, you know, relics and temples of her all over um, Cyprus, and also the myths that you're, you know, you know, taught by your family and at school. You you learn Homer and you learn Euripides rather than Shakespeare, and the tragedies are performed outdoors every summer and reinvented and you know, re, re, reproduced. And so it's just very rich in in mythology that part of the world, and you can't really escape it, even if you want to. 
And so it, it just provided a, a really fascinatingly deep and dark imaginative well for me to draw on and for all other kinds of writers in that part of the world too. It's sort of, you know, it's, um, it's, it's massive to me. And I think Euripides has always been uh, an incredible influence um, because, because he's writing in a world, you know, which is pre-psychology and yet he's able to incredibly accurately portray deeply complex psychological states. Um, so, you know, that tells us two things. Like it tells us A, that he was a genius clearly, and B, that human beings haven't changed at all in 3000 years, um, which is also fascinating. And so there's something about the Greek myths and their, their timeless nature that I find very, really, um, you know, inspiring. Um, you've spoken before about how growing up in Cyprus planted the seeds for you becoming a thriller writer, both because of the tension that existed there at the time when you were a child, um, and also because of your mother introducing you to mystery books. And it sounded like that was a, a highlight of your childhood was reading these mysteries on the beach. Um, and I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about how both of those things drove your interest in thrillers. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's hard without going into too much detail to describe um, how odd it was growing up in the Cyprus in the, you know, the early 80s, um, because um, it was divided into, you know, it was, there, was a, there was an invasion and half the island um, was occupied by Turkey and half the island was occupied by, by Cyprus and or, you know, Greek Cyprus. And I, I was in Nicosia, so the city was divided in two. Um, and it was a very, you know, real experience. And so, that, you know, there were soldiers and there were, you know, it, it was a lot that was going on and I was afraid the whole time and I was afraid that there would be a second invasion because it was what everyone spoke about um, the whole time I was growing up and so you I grew I, you know when I remember being very clearly around six or seven years old and being very very worried about what would happen to our dogs if, if, if there was another invasion and we had to flee our house in the night or what would happen to our my toys or or silly things like that and it, it, you you I'm sure that that had an effect on it you know and, and once I spoke about this in an interview saying that I think that's why I wrote thrillers because I grew up in this state of constant anxiety um, because I relate to it when people are afraid I think um, I had all of these people come out of the woodwork people I'd known for years saying oh gosh me too I, I feel exact I feel completely anxious and so I think the whole island is suffering from PTSD on, on some level um, so that's a big part of it but um, a happier part was growing up in a house full of books um, and my English mother had brought over like a small library, very much like in, in the Maidens and Mariana's mother. So I, I, I pretty much every, every writer, you know, who made me into a writer was on, on, on the shelf in our, in our house. And so my mom would just like take these books down and give them to me. And um, it was a really uh, incredible experience. Um, you're wrong about Christie though, because so my, the only books my mother didn't read, because she's a bit of a literary snob, was crying. And so, um, but my sister did, and I went into her room when I was about 13, I think, and, and saw all, she had a big collection of Agatha Christie's, and one day I must ask her where they came from. Um, and they were just these lurid covers with like eyeballs and blood and daggers and things like that. And I was like, what on earth is this? And um, I read, and then there were none one night, and then I couldn't sleep all night because I was so scared. Um, and from then on, I was just hooked. And we went to the beach that summer and I just took a whole stack of Christie's and just read them on the beach, like one after the other, after the other. And when I ran out, I went into the little hotel bookshop um, near where we were staying, would buy more every day with my pocket money. And, um, and, and there was something about that experience of just being on the beach with an ice cream and just you, your toes in the sand and you're reading a thriller. And it was just, I'd say it was the happiest reading experience of my entire life. Um, and that's what made me into be uh, a writer because I thought one day I want to do this myself. I want to write uh, a, a detective story to read on the beach, like one of Agatha Christie's. Um, and so when I finished um, The Silent Patient, I printed out a copy and I took it to the beach in Spain. And I sat there with a lot of wine and I read it over five days. And it made me really happy. It was the first time I'd ever read anything in my entire life that didn't make me want to throw up. So I was really grateful about that. And then with the maidens, every time that I got lost or afraid or anything, I would say to myself, okay, well, you just have to write it for yourself to read on the beach, write it for that kid who loved a thriller. Um, and then that kind of brought it back down to a manageable level for me, if that makes sense. But um, 
I, th I, I think there's early, I don't know any many writers actually who've spoken about that before, but I think your early writing, your early reading experiences are truly, you know, formative and, and inspirational and probably have a lot to do with where you end up, actually. That's, that's really interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you also about your connection to film and television. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned earlier, I understand that you originally started out trying to be an actor, but decided to move away from that and move towards writing. Um, you did write two screenplays, The Devil You Know, which starred Jennifer Lawrence, and The Con Is On, which starred Uma Thurman. Uh, what was your experience like working in Hollywood on those projects? Um, awful. <laughs> um, it was, was it? It, yeah, and it, well, you know, I mean, you've met there was actually a third film, the first film I wrote, which didn't even get released because it was that bad. So it was, you know, but I did feel like each experience was kind of wor worse than the last. Um, I learned an awful lot, you know, I mean, there's a whole different conversations to be had about that, you know. So, on, on the one hand, I learned a massive amount, um, which I can talk about too, but on, on a kind of more personal note, it was. It's demoralizing because you are, you're the least important person on the film set being a writer mm. and you, you know, it's painful because you, you, there's, there's stuff that you've worked on for, for years and you, and you watch it just falling apart in your eyes because a, a location isn't available or an actor isn't there that day or the director has a better idea or an actor has a better idea, which is worse. And then they sort of, you know, make it up and you just see that it's not going to work. And I would get a phone call, you know, six months later in the editing room from the director saying, oh, but it doesn't cut together, it's not gonna work, the final scene doesn't work. And I was like, well, yeah, I know that because you didn't follow the script. Um, and then, you know, it happened to me three times in a row and I just find it to be really demoralizing and heartbreaking. And that was what actually I should be grateful for really because it pushed me into writing a novel because I thought I just have to write something where I'm just not gonna get rewritten and I'm just in control from start to finish creatively. And the only way that I could do that was to sit down with a laptop and just write a story where I could be the director, the actors, the cinematographer, the costume designer, I can be all of it in a book, um, you know? And it's, it's, um, it's ironic talking about groups because um, the reason that I became a, a screenwriter is because I love being with people and I loved being, you know, I did many, many plays beforehand um, as an actor. I loved being in plays and I loved um, being in groups and I love putting on a, on a show and I love being on a film set. It's one of my favorite things in the world because you have this small family for you know, an extended period of time where you're working so hard to create something together. And it's such a beautiful experience. So the irony that all of that then drove me to sit alone with a laptop year after year writing novels you know, is not lost on me. But I, I think it's what I'm better at really to be honest with you. Well, it kind of comes full circle because my understanding is both the silent patient and the maidens have been optioned are heading for screen adaptations. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Um, the, the silent patient is going to be a movie um, and the maidens is going to be a TV series. But I am not involved in either one um, by choice, really. You know, I want to... The silent patient is being made by Plan B, who I think make best films in Hollywood. And so I'm incredibly excited. Uh, about that, but I want to see it. I'm not even going to read the screenplay when it's ready. I just, I'm just would rather go to the cinema and you know, um, and sit there with some popcorn and watch it as a fan, because I think that's going to be more meaningful to me. You know, I know, I know well enough that that screenplays never resemble the finished product, um, and I also know now that that I have my novels and they already exist, and so it's totally fine for someone to kind of reinterpret it in a different way. Um, and so when I was talking to the, the writer of The Maidens, she was asking me some questions and I, and I said, I just think I'm not going to answer them. And I think you should decide because it's your baby now, you know. And so it, it, in a way, a story gets told several times, you see. So you, you have the, the novel and then you have the screenplay, you know, the, the, it's written once again. And then the director rewrites it once again. And then finally, the editor in the editing room retells the whole story again. And then it's his story. And so it's really kind of churlish uh, to, to control things. And I think the biggest creative lesson that I've learned over my you know, 20 or so years of writing is, um, is the more I could, would control something, I would get very hung up on controlling a bad idea, a bad line of dialogue, a bad scene, and just think it had to be there and I'd be very rigid. And I was wrong in every single case, whereas now I am incredibly plastic and fluid. And so I'm not, you know, I'm not, it would be ridiculous of me to try and control it 
the, the, the film adaptation of one of my books, I think it's, you know, good luck to you and tell a different story based on mine, you know? And I know you just mentioned not having control and you wouldn't have a say in this with these projects, but when you're writing these books, do you ever think of who might be cast as these characters or think about specific people as influences when you're writing them? Yeah, I do. I think I will actually have a little bit of a say or as much as I could possibly have in these in these productions, which need just like an approval. Um, yeah, I, don't, I do and I don't. I do and I don't. I'm writing something now. I don't know if I could talk about that or not, but um, I'm writing something now for, for Uma Thurman. Um, because so she's a, you know, it'd be lovely to touch on her for a second because she was huge, huge part of, of my success. Um, I met her on this disastrous film. Um, it was so bad that it had two titles. It was called The Con Is On and The Brits Are Coming. You know, and any film that has more than one title is generally a turkey, I have to say. Um, but I met Uma and she, um, you know, she's been starring in films since she was 15 and there is nothing that she doesn't know about every aspect of filmmaking, it's incredible. And she just sat me down one day and she kind of took me through the script and she told me just, you know, that won't work and that won't work. And this is the reason why that won't work. And it was like a masterclass in suddenly understanding how to write visually and how to write something relatably to people. And then I started to tell her about The Silent Patient, which I was writing at that point. And she said so many incredible things. She just said, you know, what does um, Alicia do for a job? And I said, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe she's a writer. I hadn't really thought about it. And Uma said, well, she should be a painter because if she's a painter, she can get all of her thoughts onto the, the canvas. And so even though she doesn't speak, we can, we can get access into her subconscious. And I'm like, that's brilliant. You know, I'll, I'll use that. So she taught me so much and I've always wanted to work with her again. And so what I'm doing now is I'm writing, it's either gonna be a novella or, or a book that we're gonna make into either a TV series or a movie. And it's a thriller set on a Greek island um, for her. Um, and it's gonna be fantastic. You know, it's, it's really fun to, I guess it is coming full circle in a way, but it's not, I wouldn't attempt to write the screenplay for that, I don't think. I think I would just write the source material and let someone else adapt it, you know. But I love movies and I love, I love um, actors as well. <laughs> is, is this the, the, the project that you're just talking about? Is this the third, um, I saw an Instagram that you were posting, you were writing something set in an island. Is that yeah, the project that you're working on? Yeah, yeah that's it. You know, and what's really funny is that I think after writing The, the Maidens, um, uh, I thought that I would be really burnt out and I would just stop and not be able to write more for a while. But what happened was I think I felt so relieved to have finished the, you know, the second novel, which I think is difficult for, for every writer, um, that suddenly I felt so inspired and so freed up. So I just, and I'd been, I would just wrote compulsively and happily and, and in a, a very kind of relaxed way. So um, it's been great. It's been a great experience. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to ask a final question, then I want to give an opportunity for the audience and those watching at home to ask some questions. So um, for me, as a final question, I'm curious about, I think one of the things I'm curious to see in the next few years is the art that comes out of the pandemic. Um, because one, artists have had, in some cases, a lot more time to work on their art, to be alone, to be in isolation. Um, and also, I just think a lot of us have been through these you know, grieving or traumatic experiences, there's a lot of fodder there, I think, to, to sort of wrestle with and process. Um, and I just want to ask you, I guess, how the pandemic has impacted you personally and also how it's affected your creative process. Um, it's both hugely, yeah. Um, creatively, it's been kind of amazing because I think I was... I was trying to put off writing my, my second book because I was a bit afraid, I think. And so what I was doing was I was traveling um, and seeing all of these countries and kind of using that as a way of not actually get down, getting down to the writing. And then I got back from Norway, I think, and then suddenly um, the pandemic struck and I was locked in my apartment for about a year. Uh, and then I was finally at my kitchen table, which was the very last place that I ever wanted to be. But I was back there again. It was the best place to be because I got down, you know, sat down and got on with the writing. Um, and so I think it can go both ways. I think, you know, some people I know who are creative kind of fell apart and then other people were able to really focus. Um, and I'm just really grateful that I was able to use it as a time of just getting on with writing and getting a lot of work done, you know. Um, and, and, and emotionally and, you know, personally, yeah, it's been awful for all of us. And, and I know people I have loved who died in the pandemic, so it's been, I'm, I'm really grateful that I had something to focus on. You know, I think without it, it could have been really hard. Yeah. 
Uh, well, I'm really grateful for the questions you've been able to answer for us so far tonight, and I want to give the audience an opportunity to do so also. So we're going to bring the house lights up, I think. And then we have microphones staged here on either side. Um, so if anyone has questions and wants to come up to the mics, you can line up at either one and we'll give you an opportunity to ask. And Jillian might also have some questions from the audiences at home. I do. Can you hear me, Alex? I can, yes. All right. Well, I have a couple of questions here to get us started. One is from the Travers Area District Library, and they are wondering what role have libraries played in your life as a reader and a writer? Uh, massively. There's the British Council in Nicosia, Cyprus, where I grew up. And my mum took me there when I was about, um, I don't know, must have been about 10. Um, and, uh, and we took out my, took out my first library book. Um, and I remember what it was now. I reread it last summer and it was really unsuitable for a 10 year old. I don't know what my mother was doing, let me get that book out. Um, but it was called The Green Gauge Summer by uh, Ruma Godden, which is just incredible. But, um, uh, and, and then I would often write in libraries and I still do. Um, I used to an awful lot at university and then afterwards, and there's, there's still my local library in Hampstead that I would go to and write in. Um, I find them to be such a refuge and such a calming space in which to work. Um, so they're, they're massively important to me, yeah. All right, well, here's another one. Um, which is your favorite part of the book to write? Red herrings, twists, or the actual villain or whodunit moment? Probably it's a, it's a toss up between um, the twists and the whodunit moment. Um, it's really lovely to write the whodunit moment because it's such a weighted moment. And you know that it's got so much resonance um, when, when, uh, when it's revealed or when you're actually reading it. Um, the twists I love because I love the architecture, as I said, you know, I, I, I often think it's like a, a conjuring trick or, you know, Agatha Christie said that um, writing a, a mystery is like creating a new recipe. And she says, you don't know if it's gonna work until you, you know, cooked it and presented it to somebody and then they take a bite. And then it's, you know, that's, so it's a long process to get there. And so planning it is, is super important. And the, the, the twist is a, is a delight and a, and a joy to, to work on, yeah. Well, you know how I feel about the twist. Of the <laughs> At least <laughs> I've told Alex about five times. Uh, so I'm telling you all again, too. Um, all right. I have two more questions from our at home audience. Um, one is you come from your screenwriting background, of course. And what do you see as the big similarities and differences between screenwriting and writing the novel? And how do you approach things differently in terms of pacing and character development and dialogue? And third part of that, are there any things that work better on the page than the screen or vice versa? Okay. Um, <laughs> hello. Um, I, I think that it's, you know, I think these days, I think, I think writing, all writing is, is really influenced by cinema, you know, and so I think it's a big part of it, um, regardless of what you're trying to write. Um, I, I think the, the difference between a friend of mine um, put it really well, I think. He said that the difference between um, cinema and, and novels is the difference between expansion and contraction. And so, it, you know, in, in a cinema, uh, in a film or, or in a screenplay, you have to contract everything, so you have to keep it moving. Um, whereas in a novel, you can expand the story as much as you want. And you can get, as I said, you can go into a character's head, and you can go backwards and forwards in time. Um, and that's what I really found that I was really drawn to was that aspect of novel writing because you can have a whole universe in someone's head that you can't really do in that same way in a screenplay or at least I was never able to do. So that's the difference, I think, in lots of ways. But I, in terms of like, you know, um, characterization or the dialogue, or, I don't really think I think any differently. Again, I go back to what Uma taught me, which was just the most brilliant thing um, anyone said to me. She said that every scene needs to be an attempt at an iconic image. And um, those words just kind of burned their way through my brain because I then went back and rewrote the whole of The Silent Patient thinking that. And then suddenly I started to think about images. I started to think about, you know, about canvases and paintbrushes um, and a gun and a diary um, and just rope. And just all of a sudden all these props started coming to mind. So instead of just, you know, having dialogue, or guiding you from you know, you know set piece to set piece, I started to think about it in a visual way. Um, and I don't think that's a purely cinematic thing. I think that works just as well on the page as it does, you know? 
Um, where, where I think things get lost is when you lose, when you lose the narrative voice. And that's, that's the most important thing that a novel has, I think. And I think sometimes that gets excised from the film adaptation and then you lose some of the depth and the interest, I think. But it's, um, it's a complicated and interesting subject, yeah. All right, I, I lied, I have two more again. Um, <laughs> So I'll start with an easier one. Well, perhaps, but for people who love your books, which TV shows or other books would you recommend? Wow. Um, gosh, that's so hard. I should have thought about that before because I always go blank whenever anybody asks me to recommend anything. I just can't think of anything. Um, I think, you know, I would recommend Ruth Rendell. I think, I think I'm working my way through her over right now and then she wrote something like you know 78 novels it's taking me a while but they are i'm learning so so much and they're just incredible um in terms of tv i mean i mean i, I watch a lot of movies like hitchcock and billy wilder taught me everything so when i started to write the silent patient i sat down and i watched every single billy wilder movie because i don't think anybody does it better than him so he does exactly what i'm just talking about he he will never he always would say as well in his interviews with cameron crowe he said, you can never get a plot point um, expressed purely through dialogue. It just doesn't resonate. You have to use a prop. Um, and so, you know, in the apartment, he has the broken mirror, tells us that Shirley MacLaine has been, you know, sleeping with the, the married man, um, or, you know, witness the prosecution, it's all about the cigars. And it, there's, it, I could give you a, a billion examples of that. And it's about learning to think like that, um, which I learned from, you know, studying film. Um, so, you know, yeah. Sorry, a very bad answer to that question. I apologize. That was the easy question as well, right? That, that was. Well, maybe, <laughs> who knows? Um, okay, so here's the other one. What is your revision process like? How much re rewriting do you do? And do you ever scrap big chunks all at once? That's a great question. Um, and that's an easy question. It's, it's all about rewriting, as any writer will tell you, I'm sure. But I believe that so passionately. It's all about rubbish first drafts. and. Um, the, one of my favorite stories that I just love is that um, uh, Richard Curtis, who wrote um, Four Weddings and the Funeral, um, he said that when he wrote Four Weddings, uh, the, he sent the 25th draft was the draft that he sent out, which means that the first 24 drafts weren't good enough. And that's something I think about an awful lot. You just, you can't, I meet so many kind of young and budding writers who, who get really disillusioned because they've written one draft or something and they sent it out, they've had it rejected. And that's what I used to do when I was young. And it's just not, um, it's not the way it works. It isn't, I rewrote The Silent Patient for about a year and a half. I did about 60 drafts on it again and again and again. So what I did with The Silent Patient was I, I would print it out and then I would read it and I would make notes and corrections. And then I would type up the corrections and then I would print it out and read it again. And it was, it was a terrifying process because the corrections, they just, they didn't get fewer, they just got different. And so it was never that we were getting less and less. It was just this constant changing, shifting document. And I thought I could be doing this for the rest of my life and I will never be able to read it and be satisfied. But what ultimately happened was that I got to a point after about a year and a half where I read it and I didn't have any more corrections and everything was just ready to go. So you do get there eventually, but it's all about rewriting and rewriting and rewriting, yeah. All right, I lied to you again. Now this is really my last question. Um, and this should be the easiest of them all. Uh, could you repeat the British author's name and the book title that you mentioned as a great crime novel? In yeah, our um, Ruth Rendell, that's R-E-N-D-E-L-L. -L. And the, the book title is um, A Judgment in Stone. Um, and uh, it's great, it's really great. You can't see it, but a bunch of people just got their phones out and are typing that in. So <laughs> you'll love it. You'll absolutely, it is. It's so it's so fantastic. I can't recommend it highly. Is there anyone here in the audience that would like to ask a question? If so, you can pop up to the microphone here. Don't be shy. If anyone else wants to come up, I wish Hi. I was there in person with you. Hi, my name's Kyle. I'm a, a master's level psychologist who works here in the city. Um, and I wanted to tell you, I loved your portrayal of therapists in The Silent Patient. I haven't read the second one yet. Um, my question was that you had mentioned earlier in your speech today that you had this fear of kind of like a, a writing hangover after writing your last book. Did you have any sort of hangover after writing your first book? 
That's a good question. Um, hi, Carl. Um, no, I don't think I did, actually. Um, I think because there was zero expectation. That's why, really. Um, I wrote the, the Silent Patient and I, you know, I'd been dropped by my last agent at that point and I had, I had no, and I had no film career anymore and I had no sense that I had any career. And so I just wrote The Silent Patient because I wanted to write a detective story my whole life and I thought, well, if you don't do it now, you're never going to do it. Um, and so I, that's why I allowed myself to take years to write it and work over weekends and just, and, you know, put it in drawers and it was a real slow process. And so the fact when I finished it, it was just like, oh, I've done it for me now. There was no sense of anyone ever even seeing it. Um, but when, the, when it was then successful, the publishing right, or finishing The Maidens became more worrying because then I suddenly knew that all of these people were going to be reading it. And that was a lot scarier in my head. Yeah. Did the success of The Silent Patient make writing The Maidens any more difficult? Yeah, it did. Um, it made it considerably more difficult. And I think I was avoiding it, which is why I'm sort of grateful to the pandemic in a way, because it forced me just to do it and get on with it. Um, but it, it was, um, yeah, I think that's why I was, you know, so the book Hangover that, that I didn't experience at the end of The Maidens, I think was just to do with the joy and the relief that I had finished a second book. And you, when you write a first novel, I, I didn't, at least you don't, or I didn't think of myself as a writer at that point. I, you can, you're, you can always, you're always ready to dismiss something as a fluke or you just finish, you know, wrote one book and then that's it. Um, but I want to be a novelist. And so the, the actually finishing a second book and thinking, oh great, I've done it now. Now I can write a third book and keep going. It was such a huge sense of relief. I can't tell you how lovely that felt. Beautiful, thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anyone else here that would like to ask Alex a question? Yeah, Mike's over here on either side. And Jillian, do we have anything else online? <laughs> no, but I have a question for Alex. Just this is, I, I'll keep it quick for you. Um, when you are writing a character who is not able to see uh, something in another character, you know, their they're love is blind or they're, they're a friend, they're close to them. How do you build the the reality of what's actually going on in your character's head versus the reality of what is happening. They're seeing maybe some puzzle pieces click together and they're ignoring it or they're afraid to recognize it, but they are, they're, the closeness makes it so hard for them to see what's happening. How do you build that in a way that feels so believable and so real and brings us along as readers into the mind of your character? That's very kind, thank you. That's, yeah, it's something that I'm very interested in that kind of thing. So, you know, um, I think it kind of ties into something I've been thinking about a lot, which is I think that, you know, every, every Greek tragedy is very much like a detective story. Um, and they often have a similar kind of plot, really. And so in every, in every Greek tragedy, there's a, a hero who is trying to investigate some kind of mystery. Um, and at the end of it, there's a revelation to him which is usually devastating. So like in Oedipus Rex, um, Oedipus is the detective because he's trying to find out what the curse is to the city. And then as he progresses through the play, he realizes that he eventually realizes that he in fact is the perpetrator that he is seeking. Um, and there's something about that structure which I find really, really interesting. And so I think what we do is we lie to ourselves about a lot of stuff and I think we lie to ourselves about the people we're closest to very often. And we proper operate in this state of denial. And so I think what I was trying to do with the Maidens was to dramatize what it's like to, to be in darkness as Mariana or Oedipus are at the beginning of those books and then grope your way towards the light. And so it's this process of just trying to unpeel and uncover the truth. Um, and that's, it's kind of like a psychological detective story. I suppose is how I put it best. And I, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a very interesting process trying to do that. It's about layers, I think. Yeah. Okay, great. I'm gonna just do a last call if there's anyone who wants to ask a question. Otherwise it is almost one in the morning in Morocco where Alex is, and he's been very kind to stay up very late with us tonight. Um, for all the audiences who are here and at home, you can pick up his books, Rise and Books has them out in the lobby. They're really great, fascinating reads or support them at your local bookstore if you're watching from home tonight. And Alex, thank you so much for being with us and for sharing your stories about these great books. We really appreciate your time and, and being with us tonight.
Thank you so much, Beth. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you so much. Um, I really, really, really wish I could be there in person, and I had intended to be, you know, but COVID stopped it. But um, I'd love to be there next time, sometime. Actually well, hopefully we can get you to Traverse City for the next the next big book. So if we could all give Alex a round of applause and thank him for being tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much.